told me, hey, I got something fantastic to tell you. He said, I am affiliated with people that speak with the spirits of the dead. How would you like to talk to this, the, the spirit of your dead mother? And I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked. He said, you wouldn't be uh, afraid of talking to, to the spirit of your dead mother, would you? Well, I said, I'll tell you what, I would have to give that some thought, because it's something I never thought about before in my life. Heart Research Center presents A Trip into the Supernatural with best-selling author Roger Morneau. While still a young man in the city of Montreal, Roger Morneau became involved in the worship of demons. In this two-part series, Roger gives us a first-hand account of his harrowing brush with the powers of darkness and ultimately his divine rescue. Also joining him are Cyril and Cynthia Grossi, the very couple who first pointed Roger from the darkness to the light. Conducting this exclusive interview are Dan and Karen Houghton of Heart Research Center. Let's now join the Houghtons and Roger Morneau as we together enter part one of A Trip into the Supernatural. How in the world did you ever get involved in praying to demon spirits? Well, when I came out of the uh, Navy after World War II, I um, was looking for to take up a trade in Montreal, Canada. And at that time, I ran across uh, a fellow that, that had been on a particular ship with me. And he said, hey, Mono, you're alive. How nice to meet you. He said, let's have a dinner tonight. I said to my boss, can I have the evening off? Because I was uh, the assistant to the Windsor Bowling Alleys and uh, uh, Billiard, you know. It's the high-class uh, place in Montreal where all the dress manufacturer, manufacturing people go and uh, relax. <clears throat> so I got the evening off, and I went out, uh, we went out and had dinner. He told me, hey, I got something fantastic to tell you. He said, I am affiliated with people that speak with the spirits of the dead. How would you like to talk to this, the, the spirit of your dead mother? And I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked. He said, you wouldn't be uh, afraid of talking to, to the spirit of your dead mother, would you? Well, I said, I'll tell you what, I would have to give that some thought, because it's something I never thought about before in my life. Most of us probably haven't, a little afraid of something like that. Well, he says, you know, you know, it's written all over your face. You're afraid of, of going to a seance. But he says, I know you, he says, you're going to come. And uh, then he started telling me how brave I was when I was aboard ship, you know, <laughs> different things. He says, you're not the same man, you've changed. You're, you're chicken. That's all I needed to hear. I said, when do we go to a seance? So one Saturday evening, we were in the place. <clears throat> it was the very first time, very beautiful place, a medium, it was a lady. She had a gorgeous new home in Montreal. And there were about 20 uh, invited guests there, which I was <coughs> one of them. And uh, she communicated with the spirits for uh, different people there, and you're telling them what the spirit said. And then there was one lady that had been talking almost continually before the, the seance started, and she didn't believe in the, the, you know, the dead appearing and all of this and all that. And she said, "Well, I would have to see my dead sister." She says to believe it. So. <laughs> While this, uh, the seance was, was going, one man uh, <clears throat> said, I would like to talk to my friend that died six months ago. But I don't want him to appear. just want to talk to him. Because he says, I don't trust you talking to my, my friend for me. So the, so the uh, medium says, let me inquire of the spirit. Yeah, the spirit will, will talk with you. And that big masculine voice was heard in the place. It says, hi, Frank. It's nice of you to ask for me to talk with you. And they had a little chat. And after it was over, Frank says, this is the greatest thing honored. 
to be able to talk with the spirits of the dead. Then, this, the medium said, we have a very special surprise tonight for you people. A spirit will manifest itself openly here in a few minutes. And it's like, it's like a big gust of wind hit the building and right through the wall. Now, the, the lights weren't uh, terribly bright, but, they, you know, they were like living room lights. Uh, a couple of floor lamps and maybe some of these. And that uh, translucent being seemed to come right out of the wall. How did you feel right at that moment? It's almost like my heart stopped a little bit. Okay. You know, very weird feeling. So it was a lady in a beautiful evening gown, floor length. And she said to, to Mary, my dear sister, you are so wonderful to have asked for me. And Mary fainted and fell right off her chair on the floor. <laughs> and a couple of guys jumped up and picked her up and uh, it's very gone. And that was the beginning of it. That's how you got into it. Yeah, that's the way I got into it. After a while, you see, <clears throat> there's something interesting about the, the human uh, mind. You can adjust an awful lot of stuff. You can adjust to a lot of things that you that would terrify you to begin with after a while they become common and ordinary hmm. so you mean contact with the supernatural can become commonplace and ordinary and doesn't bother anybody yeah. in other words the more that you do it you're not uncomfortable that's it's right it's just not yeah. an uneasy feeling yeah so but how then, do you feel about then it then i got that? into a secret society that worshiped the spirits you see well, how did, okay now how, how is that different from the seance roger it happens that uh, <clears throat> The seance um, are not involving in many ways. But when you get into a secret society of spirit worshippers, then, and especially when you're invited there by the direction of the higher ups in the spirit world, you never get out of there alive. And this is exactly what my friend and I were up against. We didn't know anything about it. And. Uh, there was a very, very popular uh, uh, big band leader. Jazz, jazz, jazz musician. Band, yeah. Very famous. He played a lot in Montreal, Canada, Vancouver, the big cities. And uh, one night we went to uh, one of these uh, seances and uh, he was with his wife. Now the spirits had told him what to do. The spirit told him, there's two of these guys, give the names, and your wife will want to talk, uh, will make it so that your wife will want to talk to the, to the medium when you say that you want to go home because you're tired. As soon as you see that these guys are starting to, to, to want to leave, then leave with them at the same time. And as you get outdoors, you ask them if they're driving. They'll say, no, they're going to take the tramway a couple blocks away. Well, he's, you invite them to get in your car with you, with you and that you will take them to a fancy restaurant and, and treat them to some good food and uh, to talk about the merchant navy and that's what they did the guy uh, did and there we were in this uh well this plush restaurant pulled into a little alley and i can still see it like it was yesterday <laughs> just enough room to pass the car the back alley that happened to give on a, re a restaurant that was on st Catherine's uh, street which is the main street of montreal and um, that was quite an evening so, Roger, you're at this restaurant. What happened? Well, after we were seated, <clears throat> in entering there, the place was just full, packed tight. But there was a couple of tables against a wall that was had a reserve issue and a sign on it. And the uh, owner of the place recognized the band leader and came and said, good evening. And... Uh, you gentlemen want a table, so you're one of the reserve people. So we sat there and uh, we had our favorite alcoholic beverages, you know. Uh, and uh, as we talk, uh, uh, the band leader says, how long have you fellas been involved with sorcery? <laughs> and he chalked us a little bit and I said, exactly what do you mean? Well, he said, you know, what you people are doing, talking to, 
the supposed spirits of the dead. He says, this is, this is, this is silly. And this man had been at the seance with you. Yeah, oh yeah. And he's telling you that it's silly what you've yeah. just done. Because see, my wife, he says, goes to the seances because she gets comfort and she gets uh, something good out of it, good feeling out of it. And she lives for what the spirits, uh, you know, are going to see that the future is going to be like. To me, he says, I can't bother with this stuff. He says, I want power. I go right to the source of power. And he says, how do you think that I became famous the way that I am? Well, I said, you must have had some good luck. Well, he says, there's no such thing as good luck. He says, there's either some power working for you somewhere, or you don't get ahead in this world. Not in my, my type of occupation. So, um, it, it went from there that we went, to, we got talking about uh, spirit worship. Did it intrigue you? Or did it make you want to find out more about what exactly he was talking about? Yeah. So, he said the, the supposed spirits of the dead that you're talking with are demon spirits. You're fallen angels. They're beautiful beings. Just set it out, just like Oh, that. yeah. It didn't make you uneasy when he said they were Well, you know, it shocked you a little bit, you know. Something that you first hear uh, uh, mentioned to you. He said, uh, you guys have got a great future ahead of you. Because we've been told, the high priest of our society, secret society, has been told that the master has very special plans for you too. Now, what did he mean by the master? Uh, Satan. And uh, we were interested to hear more about it. And he told us, he says, look, we worship spirits. We worship Lucifer, the f Lucifer and all his angels. They're just as beautiful as they did they w before they were cast out of heaven. He says there was a misunderstanding in the whole thing, he says, among the inhabitants of the galaxies. And he says our master was misunderstood, and God did not bear with him like he does with, with people that make mistakes today. So we're in a warfare, good against evil. And we happen to be the evil ones, but we're not that bad. He says, I look at this business between the forces of good and evil. He says, you believe in, in uh, one person believe in God, and everyone one believes in Lucifer. It's like politics. Hmm. So the great controversy mm -hmm. is real. And you oh, yeah. heard someone talk about it that's on the other side. Mm -hmm. And to these people, <clears throat> they are sold to the fact that uh, Christ will not return to this planet with power and great glory. He's going to abdicate all claims to the planet because this, the high priest once said that uh, Christ will abdicate all claims to the planet because he knows that it is lawfully and rightfully Satan's. And at, and at that time he says, Luc uh, Lucifer, you, you, uh, you mentioned Lucifer a lot of times, but you mentioned Satan also. He says, the master, usually they, they like to talk about the master. The master will resurrect his people from the graves. Now, George is telling you all this, or the high priest? George. George. Okay, when the evening yeah. wound down, and you're putting a cap on all that, mm -hmm. you guys had consumed some alcohol. Yeah. And you, did you feel like that there was kind of a one-shot deal? You didn't know if it ever happened again? What happened? Well, that? he said, no, I said, listen, guys. He said, I, I like to have you, he says, uh, Meet some of our people. But about next week, Wednesday evening, I'll pick you up at uh, your place and uh, you're invited to one of our uh, services. Services? Like yeah. a church service? Yeah, something similar like that. It's a testimonial to the spirits. Well, how the spirits have blessed your life. See? So, uh, when we left there, I said to myself, this guy is half drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to hear from him again, you know. But uh, it, it was true. That, uh, Wednesday night came, he was there with his big Lincoln, step in, and we went to one of the uh, most beautiful areas of Montreal. Um, and uh, the place was a mansion. Now, a mansion is usually very large, we'll, we call this a little a small mansion. It was beautiful, most beautiful place. Yeah. Roger, 
your friend George took you and Roland to this mansion where people worshipped the demons. Mm -hmm. What was it like there? What kind of people were there? Well, it was a uh, big surprise for me as I kind of made up my mind an idea that they were going to be rough looking characters. But as we entered the place, I was amazed to see that they were all very well dressed, well mannered, and that a lot of the people, as we were in being introduced to people, were professionals, doctors, attorneys, uh, a lot of business people. And see what they had, they had a praise session to the gods, which is the uh, spirit counselors, which are in charge of legions of, of spirits, yeah. of demon spirits. And uh, they talk about what the, the Lord of their lives has done for them. Because they call on s particular spirits, uh, like uh, um, the god Nehoshta, which you read in Second King about. The Israelites uh, worshipped the golden serpent that Moses had made. Mm -hmm. Well, behind, behind the spirit worship, they, behind that, they were worshipping the serpent. They were actually worshipping uh, this uh, spirit Nehoshta. And the same spirit Nehoshta is the priest was telling us that the medical doctor that was telling us how he was making operations that had never been made before because people had to be uh, awake and have no have no no feeling. He was able to, uh, you know, carry on the surgeries that had not been done before. Mm -hmm. But the spirits would give that capacity to be able to uh, operate without people feeling uh, any pain and things. And also without uh, no problem with the, with the blood because as he would cut his incision, because the incisions, everything opened with no blood running. Mm -hmm. So he could do the work that has not been done before. So. Now I recall reading in your book that at this um, praise worship service they had, they would sing hymns. Why would they sing hymns in a demon worship? Yeah, um, this was kind of a big surprise to me when, I, when that took place. The priest said, hey, let's go down to the worship room of the gods and uh, have a praise session, you know, a singing session. So we go down there and what do you think, you think did they pass around? Church hymnals, you know, Christian church hymnals. And I couldn't believe this. I said, what's his business? So the priest says, well, now, he says, for those of you that are new, <laughs> let me tell you that this is the most feasible way, he says, to please the spirits. It's to deride Christ and his people, you know, and his church and all that. So they sing uh, uh, out of Christian hymnals. They didn't sing Christian words to the hymns, however. Well, they change. They change a lot of the, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and not so for it's the a good. form of it's a form of blasphemy. Yeah. Mm. Such as you see today, in the rock music world, you see the the entertainers. They have these crosses. Mm -hmm. Ladies got earrings, crosses. Mm -hmm. The guys got the cross. This is a form of blasphemy, a, a form of deriding Christ. You see. Spirits uh, cause the people to do that, to find pleasure in wearing this type of uh, uh, emblem, which is the, the cross, is the emblem of the crucifixion of Christ huh, to the Christians. Mm -hmm. So what were your impressions the first time you went down into that worship room? Well, it was, uh, we'd been there maybe a half a dozen times, and uh, the high priest uh, told us after the meeting was over, he wanted to talk to us my friend and I. So after the most we had left, he says, uh, the master of my life has revealed to me that it is time for you people to become acquainted with the worship room of the gods. Well, we started to move toward a beautiful uh, um, grand staircase. Beautiful. The banister was, was huge. It was massive. And the iron, a uh, wrought iron work that they had done, and it was a super. The beautiful decorations on the walls, the chandelier on the first landing. See, that was the first landing. About, you go down about eight or ten steps, and you had the first landing. It was huge and beautiful. The, the light arrangement was the nicest I had ever seen in my life. When we got into this, this uh, sanctuary area, it wasn't very brightly lit, but everything res was... Um, well, magnified uh, the beauty of uh, certain things, uh, you know, like uh, 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 a lot of the things were gold-plated. 
or gold trims. You see, the little altars where they had they had the, the spirits that had materialized. They took, uh, they photographed them, and then they had paintings made of them. And there was a, probably about maybe a hundred of those around the place. Sort of like a shrine. Yeah, and underneath there was a little altar where you have an incense and uh, things that they would use in their in their prayer sessions and things like that, devotions to, to certain spirits. And uh, some of the objects in there, the priest said, were solid gold. Mm. It was it was a unique experience to see that. So how did you feel when you walked into that room? I um, felt that uh, these people had power, and they had a lot of it. Did that attract you? Uh, yes and no. You had mixed feelings about it. I had it. mixed feelings about it, yeah. Because uh, to a certain extent, things looked so good and sounded so good to us. But you see, I'd been brought up in a Christian home where my parents had told us we were eight children in the family. And especially the, the older ones, you know. Uh, my dad says, well, you know, if you get involved in wrongdoing, you're going to have to pay the price. There's always a cost for everything in this world. So, this thought kept creeping to my mind. Just how far you go with these spirits before we can start paying the price. See? Yeah. So it made you just a little bit nervous. Oh, yes. But yet you kept going back. Oh, there was no way out. Because that's what we were told. You knew at that time. Yeah. So you were moving forward more on fear. More on fear, yes. Because the, the high priest said that the, the master had special plans for us in our lives. And that no one ever went into the society unless they were invited by the spirits. See, so that was made very clear. And he also expressed to us the danger, explained to us the danger of uh, uh, going against the will of the spirits. And he mentioned about this one uh, man and his wife that live in a fireproof building in Montreal. The place burned right down with a minute. Mm. He was one of their members that had decided that, well, he wanted to think things over. He, he was not going to get initiated at a time that the spread had said he would like him to be initiated in the, into the society. So in reality, Roger, you were chosen mm -hmm. by high-powered demon spirits. Yeah to be a part of their human, special, privileged mm -hmm. group. You see, these people in Montreal, the society, uh, like the priest mentioned, there's thousands of spirit worshippers, you know, in different societies of spirit worshippers in this world. But he says, we are the elite. We know the real truth about the master and his angels. And they are not idiot looking beings. They are gorgeous creatures. And from the paintings that they had on the on that in on the wall of the walls of that worship room, they were unique big beings. Especially the there was a painting full, uh, you know, full, full size, length. full length uh, painting of of uh, the fallen Lucifer above his altar, and that was very fascinating because he looked like a man of great intellect, high forehead, the way that he looked with his eyes, the way he had the eyes looking, it uh, gave you the depth of perception of somebody that is very, very knowledgeable and powerful. And, power, and powerful, yeah. So, Roger, this high priest that you talked about, he is the one that ushered you down into the worship room. Mm -hmm. Was he also the one that led out in the praise sessions that you talked about? Yes, and he had an assistant also, another priest. Okay. Now, when you would go to these praise sessions, mm -hmm. what kinds of things happened? At those, at those sessions? Well, there's a lot of uh, success stories. Positive See? mental attitude kinds of things? Well, yes, a lot of success stories. Uh, the, the masters has done this for me and that for me. I remember one uh, lumber dealer, he had like half a dozen different operations around the Quebec, and uh, everything that he touched seemed to turn to money. And he was telling about it. And then there's uh, this other person that was a clairvoyant that uh, would work only for the wealthy people, only for the super wealthy. He says, I have the know-how, 
they have the means, let them pay. So he advised in, in business transactions. He would come to him and say, listen, I, I look at this deal that I might get, you know, this factory or whatever it is, because this guy was, this person was interested in industrial real estate, see. And he would talk to the spirit and then he would, the spirit was audible to him. See, you could hear the spirit talk to him, but the, the, the man did not hear. So the spirit was telling him what, was telling the, the uh, clairvoyant what, uh, well, he called himself an astrologer, reading the moons and the stars and, you know. Now, what the was sun. the term you used for his title, this man? Clairvoyant. Clairvoyant. Oh, clairvoyant. Mm -hmm. Clairvoyant. Okay. Yes, and uh, it was interesting. This person uh, stood up and says, uh, I had this lady and her husband brought him uh, to this astrologer a bundle of money. He said, this is the deal that you, and he works at, uh, only on percentages, only on percentages. He does, he does work for set amounts of money, only percentages of what the people are going to make. So he said, they brought me a substantial amount of money. And they were very happy with it, and I thought, thought it was very reasonable. But then my guide, Spirit, says, ask them when they're going to give you the other $1,700 that is really yours. And he says to the folks, I would like to know now before we leave here, when will you have the $1,700 to give me that makes up my part of, you know, rightful part of, of, of the, uh, the, the deal? The wife fainted, <laughs> and uh, the husband says, we'll have the money for you within 24 hours. So that was this type of priest. So he was thanking the demons for helping him to know that. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Even spirits, yeah. At what point did this demon worship start to affect you personally, Roger? Well, <clears throat> it wasn't too long that the priest mentioned to us that uh, the time had arrived for us to start trusting the spirits and give the spirits a chance to work for us. And there was a number of gifts that you could choose from, you see. And um, I used to play the horses some, non, not knowledge, knowledgeable at all. I used to go to those bookies, you know, with a horse so often, but I said, hey, I would like to, to, to be able to, for the spirit to, to instruct me on the, the numbers and the name of the horses that's going to win, you know, at Belmont or uh, some other uh, <coughs> racetracks like that, <coughs> make myself a little money. So the priest says, it'll be, it'll be given you. And sure enough, one night I, I, well, I fell into a trance or, or dreamed the thing. I don't know exactly what happened, but I, I saw three races that were really going to pay big. And these horses were, were dummies, so to speak. You know what I mean? They were not really good horses. They were like the one, one horse paid 21 to 1 because he was that poor, right? The chance of winning was so poor that he paid 21 to 1 on him. And it showed me that I saw the, the, the board at the bouquet and the number on it. And I went there and uh, they said it was going to be on Saturday. Uh, that was like on Wednesday, a few days later, it was Saturday. I went there and sure enough, there they were on the boards. I went to uh, uh, the wicket and uh, handed some money and, and uh, uh, got myself... Uh, Four to six people uh, used to work at the RCA Victor, where I had worked before I went to the Navy for $18 a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, the good earners were 75 to 50 to $75 per week, uh, you know, for uh, labor. So the, the demon spirits looked on you so favorably, they began oh, yeah. to help you win mm -hmm. in your gambling. Then I went to other bookies, you see. And one day, I uh, am told of the man at the cage, where you do your bet, he says, my boss would like to talk to you. And he said, you go right through that door over there. Oh, sure. So I know the guy says, come on in. The guy's sitting behind a big desk, smoking the big cigar. So he says, you're uh, Roger. I says, yeah. He got up and walked around me. He said, you don't look that smart. I said, what, sir? 
You don't look that smart. He said that you could pick horses that are winners when they're supposed to be losers. Where do you get your help? What do you mean help? I'm not getting any help. I just happened to go and... Oh, no. We've been watching you here, he says, for a number of weeks. And you always leave here with uh, some of our good money. And I'll tell you, buddy, if you want a list of the, all the bookies in Montreal, I'll give you a list of them. But he says, I want you out of here. And don't show up again. Because somebody's going to put a... You know, what I, you know what I mean? I said, okay, sir, I want to be back again. So it's a tough business being uh, gambling. <laughs> so, <laughs> so even with uh, Spirit's help, it was tough. Yeah. Well, it's stuff he's going to shoot you, yes. <laughs> yeah. The high priest would say a number of things to you when you were in these praise services, and you went to a number of them over a oh, period yeah. of time. Mm -hmm. Talked about the issues of the great conflict. You've already touched oh, yeah. on that a little mm -hmm. bit. I want you to follow up on that a little bit more, Roger. Um, some of the things that you wrote in your book, Trip into the Supernatural, sounds a whole lot like what we as Christians today know as the great controversy. Mm -hmm. What were some of the things that, that he told you there? Well, he says that there is a great controversy going between the force of good and evil, between Christ and Satan. And he always praised the, the great master, Satan, as a super intelligent being that he is, beautiful to behold, and if he ever appears to you, you won't be able to look upon him because it will be too bright. It will just ruin your vision. The high priest said he was in Chicago, and the spirit appeared to him and said, Marno and his buddy, George, has invited them to, to the service. And the fellow that is in charge while you're away says that he's going to wreck all the work that the spirits have done for the last few years to get these people into the society. So the, the high priest, which is in Chicago, picks up the phone and calls. And the spirit appeared to him. And he said it was, he, the spirit was, the angel was so bright that he could not look upon it, uh, upon him. And he says after he picked up the phone to dial, he couldn't dial the phone because of the fact that his vision was so terribly blurred by the light, the beautiful light of the uh, bright being. And he asked, the, he zero, you know, dial zero, and the operator came on, and he, he, she had to, you know, dial for him. And they talk about uh, many, many things in regards to, you know, who's going to win this conflict. Any, any discussion about uh, fire and brimstone? Yes. <clears throat> he says, the Bible people, talking about the Christians, you know, they read in the Bible that, uh, you know, we're all going to land in a lake, a lake of fire and this and that. See, that's baloney. He says, the conflict is going to end peacefully. Christ is going to realize that, that you might as well abdicate the rights of this planet take his few people along with him to his planet in the center of the galaxies and we will be left with a master who will resurrect all his people that will be as numerous as the sand of the sea. See? And the master will rule forever and ever and ever. A happy people. And he names some of the people that are going to be there. I want to mention the names because uh, <laughs> they're known to history. Yeah, so that was quite uh, impressive. Did you always feel, Roger, that these people were telling the truth? Oh yes, yeah. yeah they were. They, they really had things down straight. Um, but uh, I was not satisfied with with the uh, the answers. And I was getting. I was there was I, there was something, and I understand now. It was the spirit of God saying, "Hold back, fellow. Hold back." And uh, the priest had talked about us thinking seriously about being initiated into the uh, uh, their into cult. The right. So they let you come to sort of a mm -hmm. take a look, see, yeah. but you can't go back for several months. Oh yeah, it's not a matter of whether you're going to be initiated or not. It's, it's when. when. <laughs> okay. You see. So they begin to press you for a commitment. So the priest said, "Look, fellas, I'm not going to." pressure you into anything, okay? But I want to show you what the spirits can do for a devoted servant. We went down 
stairs, not through the, uh, the, uh, the staircase that I talked for, the worship room and the gods, but at the other, other end of the building, went downstairs. And a number of times I'd gone there to the men's room and I heard these typewriters clicking like the dickens. Man, is going. I said, why do we have a lot of people typing in there, in that room? Well, we went there that, 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 that evening and then he knocked and the man says, come on in. And there was all those typewriters moving along by themselves, typing at the speed that I'd never seen before. And not only that, the, the, the high priest says, I want to show you something clever. So he says, follow me. So we went around the table. There was a, like two long tables, and they had about ten typewriters. And he says, now notice that, that the typewriter types to the right, then, then doesn't go back. It types back to the left. Isn't that something? I had never heard of things like that before. He said, the spirits are doing the work. And he introduced us to the man. And the man is a lawyer. And he said, how much money did you make last year? Or he says, send the six figures. You see? So this lawyer had a business yeah. in the building that housed the worship room. Oh, yeah. And he had a whole room full of typewriters. Yeah. And he put paper in there and demons That's typed. all he did. Put typewriter, uh, paper in there. I, it was and, and what came out? What was it that came out? Different uh, uh, briefs for mm. court uh, cases. And so he would sell these to people? Oh, oh yeah. Okay. He had the service to, to, to the, uh, to the uh, legal profession. And the high priest was the showing... The United States and Canada. So the high priest was showing you this mm -hmm. to give you an idea about the kinds of blessings that you would That's receive? That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But after you left that typewriter, the, the room where the lawyer was, mm -hmm. they tried to draw you into a commitment by getting you to make a public oh, profession. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Well, they have a, a super beautiful resort in the Laurentian Mountains, which is north of Montreal, north of Saint Agathe. Saint Agathe is a famous name there in, in Montreal. Montrealers, because they all go Saint Agathe or north there, you know, the summer home and things like that. So they had a, a big uh, uh, resort up there for their people, you know, so it's a close uh, society. And they had uh, uh, on uh, October. The 30th. Halloween? Is that uh, October 31? 31. 31. Yeah, last day of uh, October. Uh, they had uh, what they call live animal sacrifices. I don't know what it is. But they did. We, we, we could never find out. Uh, by the time that, I l that the Lord pulled me out of there, I had not yet found out what, what it was. So you have this uh, intrigue involved in there. And um, you talked about. Um, Three, three very unique services that, that I had attended there that sit on my mind forever. One was entitled Christian Idolatry. <clears throat> Another one was entitled The Super Deception of, of a Glorious New Age, which actually applies to the New Age today. And this was 1946, we were talking. And then the other one was Satan's Great General Council of the 1700s. And Mr. the things that I heard there was an eye-opener. First of all, we'll go through the Great General Council. Okay. At the beginning of the 1700s, said the High Priest, Satan and uh, all his spirit counselors held a Great General Council with one purpose in mind. It was to prepare for the great industrial age that was soon to break upon the world. And uh, Lucifer also foresaw another age that was to follow that, where tremendous scientific discoveries would be made by people and we would enter an, a unique age that would change the way that everybody lives. It would also serve to usher in the end times and the close of the great controversy between the forces of good and evil. And the priest said that, that Lucifer had been studying the Bible and he found in, the, in Daniel 12, 4, where we are told about the time of the end Many shall run to and fro, knowledge shall be in increased. Mm -hmm. He understood it to be that we're getting to that point. And he had, with all the spirit counselors, to change their modes of operation in order you know, to ensnare people. Mm -hmm. And uh, he devised a way whereby people would disqualify themselves from being members of Christ's kingdom. 
And he was just very candid about this. Oh, yeah. Telling mm -hmm. you and yeah. the rest of the group, 60 or 70 people there, yeah. the plans that yeah, it was 100 people. Lucifer he, had revealed to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the time the council came to a close, they had three major policies that were going to be followed. First, they were to see to it that humans would be made to believe that Satan and his angels do not really exist. Because see, up to that time, you could walk down a, a street of Paris and you would have signs that would, that would say where well, you have a, a soothsayer or, you know, or a, a fortune teller of some type. And, and if you want to put a, a curse on someone, you could go and see this other old lady over there, you know, the, the old witch, that's the way it goes. Uh, but now it had, it had to change. Lucifer says, we have to make sure that people, humans, get to believe that, uh, that Lu Satan and his angels do not really exist. You know, Roger, that's interesting because a recent research study report that I read indicated that in a national survey, I believe it's over 75% of people mm -hmm. do not really believe in a real tangible devil. Mm -hmm. But there is one. Oh, yeah. Now, the next thing that the... the, the three parts policy that they had uh, adopted there. The second one was to find a way of being able to get total control of people's minds. And that would be done by taking hypnotism out of the realm of the occult and introduce it as a new science for the benefit of mankind. So part of what the high priest told you was Satan's strategy to take total control of people's minds. Mm -hmm. They felt that uh, by taking hypnotism out of the realm of the occult and introducing it as a new science for the benefit of mankind, they could then use people of great renown, educators, people of capacity, that would uh, do great things such as supposedly regress people in time to, pre uh, to former lives that they had. Mm. And, of course, after the session is over, the person would not know a thing about ancient history. And the person that she's talk, she or he has talked about uh, performing, you know, certain deeds, we'll say, uh, three, four thousand years ago. But this was their, their strategy. Now, th what this would, uh, would do for the, the thing is this, that uh, it would create in the minds of the general public, solidly set in the mind of the general public, uh, an unwavering trust in that great deception. In other words, people could, you know, it, they would believe it. This person is, is, was hypnotized, was regressing time to, you know, former lives, and uh, did this and did that, and no deception, maybe Alexander the Great, we'll say, uh, you know, and some of his generals and people like that. And the person after the session is over, you know, brings out, comes out of hypnotism, and he or she doesn't know what she's talking about. So. So now this would be a way of, of uh, de-Christianizing the Western world through the avenue of mysticism. Mm. Now the time came when uh, Lucifer decided that he had to choose a person to initiate this thing. And uh, Franz Mesmer, which was an Austrian physician, was chosen. Because and the priest told you all of this. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because he was most capable. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> Mesmer originated a theory called animal magnetism, later on, later on named mesmerism. Mesmer was led by the spirits to believe, and this is what the priest said, was led by the spirits to believe that certain persons have a magnetic influence within themselves, so to speak that would cause them to have great power over, over other persons, even to the point of placing them into a trance. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, that was readily accepted by people in general, at the, at the time that uh, Mesmer lived. So people realized, you know, they said that some people have got the capacity to put you into a trance. That's the way. Now, by the time that he died, In 1815, a lot of the physicians in Europe 
were using hypnotism as a means of anesthesia. Now, hypnotism is the same as mesmerism? That's right. Okay. So, mesmerism has that's been uh, uh, developed to a higher degree of uh, refinement. And uh, <coughs> the priest went on saying that he, the plan of Satan, uh, to um, deceive the human family this way, he says is the most intriguing thing to his mind. And he went on saying how it was going to be brought about. He said that <coughs> a fellow by the name of uh, Darwin and uh, another fellow by the name of uh, Thomas Henry Huxley would be used by the spirits because in their uh, childhood, they had been hypnotized by medical doctors. And they figured that, that they would be real good subjects uh, to uh, lead the people uh, into this belief uh, that they had, uh, that Satan wanted to bring into people's lives. Now, what were those three points again, Roger? The three things yeah. were, number one, that they did not want Satan Satan did not want the human family to think that he or his angels existed. Right. The second point that you made had to do with taking control of people's minds. That's right. The third point was what? Was to destroy the Bible without burning it. Okay. See. And what was his strategy on that? On that, um, it was very interesting. Because after the great general council, it was decided that Satan would tutor Charles Darwin personally in setting up the uh, uh, the principles of his theories of evolution. He was tutored by Lucifer himself, the fallen Lucifer. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was understood, Satan and his uh, spirit counselors understood that if a person was led to believe in the theory of evolution, it would, in his life, destroy completely the, the, the uh, creation week of the Bible the fall of Maine and plan of redemption. It would go away with it. In one fell swoop. Yeah. Now, he made a, a unique statement. He said that according to the spirits, anyone that teaches a theory of evolution is considered to be a minister of the great religious system. See, they call it the religious system, uh, the theory of evolution, <laughs> because mm -hmm. it is a, a system of schooling people and getting them to disqualify themselves from being members of Christ's kingdom. And he said that every teacher of that theory is recognized by the spirits as a person of great value and receives a very special unction from Satan himself, giving great power to induce spiritual blindness, to convince and convert. Three capacities are given to those teachers of the theory. Then, that's not all. The priest says that l Satan considers the teachers of the theory of evolution to be so valuable to him that in the sight of all the inhabitants of the galaxies, he assigns a retinue of bright, beautiful angels to follow that, that uh, educator all the remainder of his life. And that in the sight of the inhabitants of the galaxies is the greatest honor that he can bestow upon his workers, on mankind, and to... Uh, you know, until the controversy is finished. Mm. That was quite uh, enlightening. Now, the high priest was talking just sort of like a preacher would talk up front. Was he enthusiastic? Did he have a, was he, did he seem like he had bought into this and was excited about oh, it? Oh, yeah. He believed it 100%. No question about it. So everything. Why, why would he be so excited about <coughs> spirits trying to deceive human beings because obviously out of this council of the 1700s deception was a major part mm -hmm. of the strategy why well he says deception it's like politics you know you believe in one candidate the other person believe in the other candidate and they're all they're, they're fighting to get to get you know the position and it's just a matter of who's gonna be the smartest and with uh, lucifer the fallen cherubim uh, he's very smart. He's going to win, and Christ is going to abdicate the, the you know, the rights of the planet. He's going to resurrect his people, have established his kingdom that lasts for uh, ever and ever. God won't be able to destroy him because it would be against against God's, uh, the Creator's 
nature to destroy Lucifer in the fire. Beside that, he said, uh, spirits now, demon spirits, have the capacity now to outlive fire. He says, you don't believe it, go to India or, or, or some of those uh, countries where they have uh, uh, fire walkers. And it's done by the power of demon spirits. These people are energized by demon spirits so they can walk on those hot coals without burning themselves. And this is what the high priest said. And he says, if they, you want to use uh, fire, they can use it. It's not going to burn anybody. So that's the way, that's the way they believe. Once so they believe. This, this high priest was almost talking to your group in an evangelistic fervor. Oh, yeah, because he figures that uh, he's going to be one of the higher-ups in, in, in the great kingdom. Okay. So. Now, of the group that was there that night, 60, 70 people, I think you've mentioned before. Yeah, it varied. How many of those were people who were hardcore members, and how many of them were new inductees? Oh, we, were only, we were the only two uh, was youngsters, you and, so to speak. You and your friend. And how old were you at that time, Roger? I was about uh, 20. 20 years old? Mm -hmm. Did you have a feeling of awe over the fact that you had been chosen? Yes, in a way. And then I, I got thinking about this. When am I going to have to pay the price? The cost. My parents had brought me up like this. If you get involved with evil, you're going to reap what you sowed. So you want to uh, be upright in life. And if you associate with evildoers, they'll probably lend you in jail or somewhere else that you wouldn't want to be. So there's always a price to be paid. So you had that little something yeah. maybe instilled by your mother yeah. Yeah. and father a long time ago that kept you from yeah. making that full commitment. Now, one of the things that uh, really amazed me and, and uh, shocked me and made me sick at heart is when the priests uh, talk about uh, Christian idolatry. What is... Christian idolatry. The priest mentioned that word. Yeah. Tell us tell us what he said, Roger. He said that Christian idolatry is the the, the most grandiose or great deception that has ever been brought up upon the uh, human family, upon mankind. And he says in any boasted that demon spirits are continually defiling Christian churches through the avenue of necromancy by using a form of spirit worship that involves hundreds of millions of Christians into idolatry without their being aware of it. Now what is necromancy? Describe nec or define necromancy for me. Their belief, popular belief of necromancy, is to conjure the spirits of the dead. So and that you can speak with someone who has died. Right. Like the seance that you originally went to mm -hmm. was the practice of necromancy. Yeah. Now, the priest says that the, su the super deception is brought about in only one way, through the deceptive belief that man has an immortal soul that lives on after death. And he said that constitutes idol idolatry through necromancy. So he says there are hundreds of millions of Christians that are practicing idolatry. Well, they think they're glorifying God. <laughs> See? Because they believe that the soul is immortal. Yeah. They may not be talking to the yeah. supposed spirits of the dead. Oh, yeah. Contrary to popular belief, necromancy does not consist of conjuring the spirits of the dead. The reason being that man is totally mortal and does not possess an immortal soul. So who are they talking to? He says, the friendly demon spirits that have always found over the centuries great delight in impersonating in apparitions, departed loved ones, and persons of great renown. Now, friendly demon spirits. Friendly demon spirits. Are there more than one kind of demon oh, yeah. spirits, mm -hmm. Roger? Well, there's three main divisions, and then there's divisions within those divisions. You have the friendly demon spirits that seem to have uh, their finesse and their refinement, and uh, they're not upset about what happened when they were thrown out of heaven, from what I gather. Then you have the warriors. They like to bring misery and destruction in the lives of people. Then you have the oppressors. The oppressors are, are the real, wicked spirits that, that hate God with all of their, the Creator with all of their might, you know. So, he went on explaining, he says, now, necromancy is in reality a belief, a religious belief. People believe that the dead have entered into a higher state of existence than they had when they were alive. 
Also, that they are in a position and have the capacity to help the living here on earth. See? Then he said, it's, he says, this is where things get really interesting. He said, according to the great master, a person does not have to supposedly call upon the spirits of the dead to receive help, you see, to be involved in the necromancy. All he needs to do is to believe in life after death. Because he said, necromancy is the belief that man is human, uh, as a human being, as an as immortal soul. So anybody that believes that man has an immortal soul is involved in necromancy. It's that simple. That's the way he explained it. Hmm. Yeah. So how does that <coughs> constitute idolatry? By people believing that they are either talking to the saints, you see, the spirits of the dead, dead saints, or a dead relative, or a dead person of some type. And you take, for instance, like uh, Loretta Lynn, she owes, she says on national television, and uh, I have the data on it, that, that, that I heard it myself, she said that she was made successful in her singing career by a dear friend of hers, it was the same age as she, and died when she was 18 years of age. And Loretta was trying to get into the, the singing world, you know, but it, it, it would, she says, I had no success at all. Until one night I was sitting in bed reading a book, and she says, who walks right through the wall with my, my friend, the spirit of my friend? And she says, Loretta, I'm going to make you a very famous person in singing Western uh, country music, and I will be with you all the time. Trust me. And she says, uh, she had a big concert one, once, and she was coming down with this bad cold, and she thought that her voice was going to give. She talked to her spirit and felt, felt that she was going to be helped. And she got in the, on the stage and she s started to sing and right in the middle of where she really needed uh, the power, no power at all. And her spirit friend tapped her on the shoulder and said, and started to sing for her. She said, her voice went through me, the power. Mm -hmm. And you saw this in a television documentary? Tele yeah. yeah. So this was, I believe, 1976 it took place. Now, the priest explained that when people believe in uh, this business, they are actually opening themselves to be completely deceived by demon spirits because it gives the demon spirits an opportunity to impersonate the dead, see, and for people to believe their lies. And the priest says that thrills the... It, first of all, he says it brings the great master the respect and the reverence that is due to his great name. And it makes all the other spirits exceedingly happy because they are the ones that have worked to lead people to believe in life after death. You see? And they rejoice. Also. And that's the extent of uh, what Christian idolatry is all about. Friendly spirits, just to digress for just a moment. You mentioned three different categories, and the friendly spirits are the ones that love to in, impersonate oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, a being, a historian yeah. or something. In yeah, your they specialize in that. In your experiences in the praise services or in the worship room or the other places where you were, any of the places you were, mm -hmm. did you ever witness a, an event where necromancy or even uh, something that would be popularly called channeling today mm -hmm. took place, where you actually heard the voice of someone in response to someone's oh, yeah. questions? Yeah, a number of times, but there was one time in particular that fascinated me because <clears throat> um, it was unique in, in one way. The priest told us that there was a French historian that was affiliated with Montreal, uh, University of Montreal, which is a French university, in, and the English university is McGill. So the University of Montreal is the French uh, uh, university. And this man was from Paris, but he's affiliated with the university. And he wanted to have some details in regards to uh, Napoleon Bonaparte and one of his generals. So, by the way, there are also, in other parts of the world, elite spirit worshippers like the group that we had in Montreal. And he mentioned there that, uh, he said, 
you guys are f fortunate when uh, my friend and I w uh, went in because you right in time to see something very interesting. My friend there is having his devotions and the worship room of the gods, and he will uh, use uh, a trans medium to converse with uh, certain demon spirits that uh, will inform him uh, in regards to ancient history by Napoleon. And sure enough, we went down there and uh, uh, somebody came up and said he's ready to for the, the session and we went down there and uh, he said he would need uh, three people. Um, you would need three people but he wanted five people that volunteer to be the channel for the spirit, okay? So, it was three, was three of them were chosen there. And the others went back and sat down. And uh, the man shook his head like, a little bit like this. His eyes went glazed. And he stayed at it for a half hour. And the spirit spoke to him. He said, I'm a, I'm a spirit counselor. And what would you like to know? And uh, the, uh, he had a clipboard historian and asked him some questions. This historian was from Paris. Yeah. And he was wanting information. S some detailed information. Uh, about Napoleon. Napoleon Bonaparte and one of his generals. And so he asked the questions of one of these human beings mm -hmm. that was channeling. Oh yeah, the voice changed and everything. The voice changed the, the person completely. Okay. And, uh, and it identified itself as a spirit guide. Oh yeah, spirit counselor, yeah. Okay, a spirit counselor. And yeah. And then proceeded to tell him all the events that he was asking, yes. answer his question? And there was a, a certain question that was asked, and the spirit counselor said, I will have Lord Remy and Lord Alphonse duplicate, in other words, the, con the uh, dialogue that had taken place. Oh, a in little, the two little other, drama. Yeah, a little in the two other uh, men, men uh, fulfill what he was looking for. But the one thing that interests me, is uh, the mayor of Montreal, Camillien Hood. During World War II, at the beginning of the war, he was very controversial when it regards to, to the war effort. He, was, he would tell the French-speaking boys not to go into the uh, armed service, you see, because you're going to go and shed your blood for the British, you know, <laughs> and uh, we're, you know, were their servants, so to speak, and all that, and he didn't want him to go in, into war. And they put him in prison. He was jailed for the, for the length of the war. For this. Now, the man said, I would like to have you tell me to the spirit uh, to give me part of the speech that was given by Camelien Hood on, on these uh, steps of the Montreal City Hall on a certain date. There are different versions of what has taken place, and you, Lord, would know the, the exact one. Now, the mayor of Montreal was still alive. He was still alive. And this historian is asking mm -hmm. what was actually said at a speech. Yeah. Okay. The spirit counselor said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. All of my activities and my people have taken place in Europe. However, after my departure, uh, our departure, other spirits will come and help you. And sure enough, the, 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 the guy vibrated a little bit, and he's back, and he says, boy, how long? He said, 20 minutes have been used as a channel. So they, um, again, the spirit entered into him, and uh, the spirit said that he was a spirit counselor that could give him the information that he was looking for. So, um, again, it was given verbally, and it was the voice of Chameleon Hood. Now, how did you know that it was the voice? Well, because of the fact, you see, I was a youngster in those days, <laughs> just about ready to go into the army. And uh, Chameleon, we used to listen to the uh, radio. We had no television in those days, so it was only radio, and read newspaper. And all the speeches of Chameleon made and all of the, it was on the radio all the time. And in those days, they had no tape recorders, as, as we have now. So they would, Chameleon would have to go to the uh, Canadian Broadcasting Studio, Studio, where they made a record, a real phonograph record, and then they played it over and over, you know, for the rest so of the day. So you theater. listened to those as a teenager before you went into oh, the army. So you yeah. knew his voice. So his voice was really good. So uh, I said to uh, uh, George, 
He was sitting next to me. He said, isn't it amazing? He said, if you think that's amazing, wait, he says, until the spirits uh, impersonate one of the departed people that you know personally, like an uncle or a brother or a sister or something like that. He says, that is unique. But that's the way it was. You are able to reproduce a, a voice, man, and... Angry. You just uh, fix it and keep on working. And uh, I told him, well, it didn't make sense to get angry with the machine. It's an inanimate object. And uh, he sort of apologized for his uh, getting angry with his machine. And uh, we started a conversation there, and it gave me the opportunity to uh, sort of introduce him to some of the things I had experienced just a few days before. And what, uh, were, what were the things that you had just experienced a few days before? Uh, I was getting some Bible studies from a minister named Elder Warren Taylor. <coughs> and uh, although I wasn't an Adventist, I uh, was quite moved by those Bible studies because of the fact that as he gave the Bible studies, he kept it quite simple. And he would... So we go downstairs and uh, um, I said, do you have any suggestions? How to how to fix this problem? No, not really, but he says, I have a suggestion that might help. He says, I heard you, he says, calling upon God, but it was not in the way that I would have liked to hear you talk. He says, go easy on God, he says. Did that offend you, Roger? And, you know, I said, thank you. It did not offend me, because it was pleasant about it. And I said, you know, I said, thank you. I said, I'm sorry if I offended you by my language. It sounded, he says, it didn't bother me. I said, by the way, I said, this is the opening. You're quite a religious man, I understand. Yeah, he says, I read the Bible and go to church. That's great. I said, what denomination do you belong to? Well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Excuse me? Repeat that again? He says, yeah, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Did that shock you? Uh, well, the word Adventist shocked me. The Adventist, you see, I had heard so much about the Adventist, but uh, Seventh-day Adventist, I had never heard the, the name before. I said, uh, what does it signify, the name? He says, well, we're uh, seven-day observers. We, we believe in the Bible Sabbath that God has blessed that particular day of the week and has sanctified it. It's put a special blessing on there and that we ought to count our blessings on the seventh day and, you know, give God the honor that is due to his holy name. Is that any difference between what they call, some people call the Adventists and seven Adventists? Oh no, it's just the same people. Most people just talk about the Adventists and they you know people know that they're talking about the seven Adventists. Then your interest was really peaked. Now, now I said, man, what a unique thing to have happened to me that I meet one of these guys. You're together out there at your first break time mm -hmm. and you're discussing the, the language on the, the job when the machines had broken down but you had an opportunity to begin to share some of this newfound faith that you had been discovering. Right. Uh, did you find him to be interested, uh, open? Well, what really happened was um, he would ask questions. And uh, I found out later that the reason he asked questions was when I went to get the job, I was so impressed with Elder Taylor's Bible studies that I told the employer right away that I didn't work on the Sabbath. He said, well, that's all right. You don't have to work on Sunday at all. I said, no, Saturday. So being a Jew, he became rather interested. And he told Roger, uh, Roger told me later on, check this fellow and find out why he keeps my Jewish Sabbath. So Roger's uh, questions were motivated by the fact that he was told to check. And the more questions Roger would ask, the more interested he became himself. So uh, as he became more interested and I told him more, uh, he suddenly said, uh, I want to hear more about your religion. And I said, okay, this weekend. He said, no, tonight. So uh, we uh, talked about a number of things. And after lunch, uh, I told him, I said, I want to see you at 3 o'clock. Again, I want to uh, have another question for you. So 3 o'clock came along, we had the, the coffee break. And um, many things that passed through my mind. And I knew that if I get involved with, with the religion, the spirit is going to destroy me. So I've been assured, we've all been assured of that. You don't de deviate from, from the will of the spirits. Otherwise, you're you nothing, your history. So um, I told him, I said, uh, 
Sir? Would you show me out of the Bible the things you told me today? If I went to your house? He says, yeah. Yeah, he says, yeah, I'd be glad to. He says, uh, um, when, next week sometime? No, no, not next week, tonight. Did he look surprised when you said that? Yeah, he surprised. He said, uh, what's the big hurry? I said, I can't tell you why. But it, it has to be tonight or never. He said, you serious? I said, yeah. And you can't tell me why it has to be tonight? I'll tell you the reason why. He says, I would like to have you come another night. Because I have my collection of jazz records that somebody's coming to, to look over. He had been collecting jazz records for years. And he said, I have some buddies interested to, to buy them. But he said, well, I said, well, forget about it then. And he said, man, he said, you really, you really mean what you say? That you want to see these things in the Bible? I said, sure. Okay, he says, come to my place 7 o'clock tonight. Give me his address. So that evening, 7 o'clock sharp, I rang the doorbell. Did that startle you? It startled me because uh, it was fortunate I had 28 Bible studies for busy people, something I just bought. And I ran home, uh, Cynthia and I were married at this time. And I ran home and I told Cynthia, we have to give some Bible studies because this fellow's coming tonight. So I went through the first couple of Bible studies as quickly as I could and got myself familiarized with them. And uh, we got all ready and <coughs> sure enough he came. And we sat in that room, the room that we talked about that burned. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started those Bible studies. And he was very interested. Cynthia, that mm -hmm. first night that you had your Bible studies with Roger, how many studies did you actually do with him? We did four. On the first night? On the first night. We started promptly at seven. And uh, as we went through, and we went through with everything in detail, in full detail. And um, we thought that, oh, this is just going to last the evening, and that would be the end of it. And then he said, no. He says, um, let's, let's do the next one. So each one. So we didn't finish until about 11.30 or quarter to 12. And when we finished, he'd, he'd, he'd sit around and talk. By the way, he was a chain smoker. The room was covered with smoke. We could hardly see the Bibles in our laps. <laughs> and we had discussed this prior about him smoking. And uh, so we decided, we prayed about it, and we asked the Lord that even though um, each time he came, the room was just heavenly, he uh, full of smoke, that we will read his word and that he will take care of the smoke. And I happened to be allergic to cigarette smoke, and we were all huddled together. It was, it was really something to see us. 28 Bible studies in a period of one week, seven days. Seven days, four hours a night. Four hours per evening, yeah. 28 Bible studies. Now, they didn't plan this. So, <clears throat> as we chatted, and I just met Cynthia, now, um, Cyril told me, I got, I got to explain things to you a little bit. I am not a baptized member of the Seventh Adventist Church. I'm just studying into the, the, the church doctrines with the minister. He says, my wife is a Seventh Adventist. But he said, now I, I think I'm going to be baptized also to be a Seventh Adventist. But I said, I'm not one right now. Now he says, my wife is the one that really knows the Bible. I don't know much about it. And I think that she's got the right study for us tonight. He says, it'll take about an hour. Can you spare that much time? Oh, I said, evening is yours. Well, she had a, a set of Bible studies that were entitled uh, 28 Bible Studies for Beze People. That was the title of the, of the, of the series. She, she pulled one out and she says, now, we could <coughs> see here, there's a different questions. First, the first one was on the Word of God. And she read the question and said, then we can find the, the verses in the Bible that tell, gives us the answer. And the next question, she said, would, would you like that? I said, beautiful. Let's go. So Sarah was sitting next to me with his Bible because he was able to find where it was. I, and I had never opened a Bible in my life. Never. So, because I never had access to it. Let's put it this way. And that's where it, it started. On the Word of God. After the Bible uh, thing was over, he says, well, did you find it interesting? I said, most interesting. 
very interesting. I said, what's the next study coming up? Well, he said, the next study? Oh, Daniel 2, Prophecy of Daniel the Prophet, too. On the uh, world events, you know, the predicting the different uh, great world empires that were to come into existence in times ahead. And I said, really? That's very interesting. I said, um, how long would that one take? Oh, she'll take about an hour. She says, yeah, between 20 to 25 questions, he says, you know. So um, I said, uh, let's have it now. Oh, well, she said, no. She said, uh, when, when, uh, when could you come back? I said, why come back? Did it, she look surprised? She looks very that? surprised because she, and she looked at her husband. And he looked at me. And I said, hey, you guys like the Bible or are you getting tired? No, 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 we, we like to study the Bible. I said, let's have another Bible study. It's only 8 o'clock, you see. And at that time, you were a smoker, weren't you? Oh, a smoker. You can say that again. I, I was like a chain smoker, you see. And when I, when I had accomplished something worthwhile, I used to reward myself with a cigar two or three times a week. And uh, this, this, is what the, where, this is what the love of God, the power of the love of God operates in the lives of those that the Lord is trying to bless. And in the lives of those that are bringing the blessing. Um, now this did not take place, first of all, we kept on studying, we had four Bible studies that evening. And when it came to nine o'clock, we had Daniel 2 over with, I said, what's the next Bible study? And she said, well, oh, the one that we're going to have, uh, will you come on the weekend? Could you come on the weekend? I said, yeah, I said, I can't come on the weekend. What is, this, what is the title of it? She gave me the title. I said, man, that's interesting. It's only nine o'clock, let's have it now. Cyril looks at, at her, you know, with very surprised look on his face. And Cynthia, she looked at him. And I said, what's going on between the two of you? <laughs> it's like you have a conspiracy that says that we're not going to study the Bible with this guy more than, you know, that, than uh, an hour or two. But she said, let me be honest with you. Our minister, Pastor Taylor, has been giving us uh, instructions on how to give Bible studies. Because Cynthia says, you know, I never have given Bible studies. And we really wanted to know how to give Bible studies to people that ask us the reason of the hope that is in us. And he told us exactly how to do it. You have one Bible study per week. If the people are exceedingly interested, you could have one in the middle of the week, the other one. But never more than that. And she says, we've already passed our quota. So the reason, Roger, for their hesitancy Mm -hmm. was not the fact that you were blowing smoke in their face. Oh, no. no it it was because they were w trying to follow the instructions that their pastor had given, mm -hmm. and you were asking them to break all those rules. That's right. Do you think they could sense your urgency? They, several and Cynthia told me later, yes. They said there's something very unusual about this man, Cynthia told her husband, because they uh, went to get uh, water, and uh, to get me a glass of water, and uh, she went in the kitchen to get something else, whatever it is. And uh, she said, uh, what do you think of him? And Cheryl said, there's something very unusual about this man. He said, you want to study the Bible? Let's study the Bible. We won't tell about Elder Taylor. Let's not say a word to Elder Taylor. <laughs> you know, we're going to ruin the whole thing. We're going to keep it give, a secret. Because the, the minister had <laughs> said, you know, you give people a spiritual, a spiritual indigestion, and they'll never want to open the Bible again. But this shows that there are some times when someone's yeah. appetite for it is right. so strong yeah. that you have to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, yeah. That's it. And they, they had prayed about this thing. Now, Cyril had told his wife, this man is coming for Bible study at 7 o'clock tonight for a Bible study. And he smokes. He's a smoke fiend. What are we going to do? Should we tell him not to smoke in our home? He said that. If we do that, I'm afraid he's not going to stay for the Bible study. What would have happened if they had asked you not to smoke? I would have said, I'm sorry. You're not my kind of people. You see, you're too, uh, you're too reserved for me. I'm sorry. And, I, and, and still to this day, I thank God for the leading of the Holy Spirit that at that crucial time moved in there and inspired these, these people to say, you know, wouldn't you die... Cyril, Cyril for us, to save us all for Christ, Cynthia said to her husband. He said, yeah. It's not going to kill us, even if we inhale all the smoke that he, that he puts out. Right? Because they had prayed about it, and then they had thought.
thought about it, and then when it came to be quarter to seven, he said, what are we going to do about the smoking? Are we going to tell him not to smoke or what? And then when she came out and she, she said, you know, let's put up with it. Well, we had that third Bible study. Now it's 10 o'clock. And I said, uh, uh, by the way, what's the next uh, title? And she told me about it. Said, My goodness, this is a beautiful Bible study. I said, let's have it. <laughs> and he, he, he said, you know, really, Roger, we've studied too much tonight. We're never going to be able to remember these things. Oh, I said, you'd be surprised. I got a mind, a mind like a sponge for the things that I like. He said, you're enjoying yourself. I said, never heard anything like this in my life. Let's have another study. You, what time do you go, people go to bed? First of all, I don't want to, uh, you know, infringe on your, on your uh, regular uh, habits of uh, resting yourself. And, she, well, he said, we go to bed at uh, 11 o'clock. Beautiful. I said, go on, uh, Santiago. And Cheryl says, go on, Santiago. And we had another Bible study. Now the Bible studies are over. And I said to myself, if I'm still alive, I want to be here tomorrow night. Did you seriously doubt whether you would be alive oh, the following I, night? I felt sure I was going to be killed, going to be destroyed in some kind of an accident. Okay. Uh, because I've heard of so many cases. So I knew that I was not, this is the way I felt. I was not going to be alive tomorrow night. If for some reason I'm alive, I want to be back here with study the Bible with these people, see? So I said, uh, what are you people doing tomorrow night? Not too much. What about 7 o'clock? Another Bible study. And uh, she looked at her husband and, and she, she he, he looks at her, you know, and, and she, he said, hey, we won't tell Elder, Elder Taylor. We won't tell him a word about it. We'll just do it. We'll just do it. He says, we'll be here at 7 o'clock tomorrow night waiting for you. The next night, man, I was there. Four more Bible studies, see, and more smoke. This has been part one of A Trip into the Supernatural, an interview with best-selling author Roger Morneau, as conducted by Dan and Karen Houghton of Heart Research Center. The conclusion of this exclusive interview is contained in part two. Footsteps walking down his hall. He lived at the end of a long hall, and his door was the only door down that hall. And the footsteps would stop as his, at his door. Then a rap would come to the door. And at midnight, we heard the footsteps coming down the hall. I said, uh, Roger, put your hand on the doorknob and get ready to pull it open. And so, with all the bravado that I could muster with a gun, I uh, waited for the rap on the door, and there it came. Heart Research Center presents Part 2 of A Trip into the Supernatural with best-selling author Roger Morneau. In Part 1 of this exclusive interview, Roger Morneau told about his experiences with Satanism as a young man. Joining him again in Part 2 are Cyril and Cynthia Grossi, who helped Roger break away from the power of darkness to discover a loving God. Conducting this interview are Dan and Karen Houghton of Heart Research Center. Let's now watch the conclusion of A Trip into the Supernatural. We continued and we continued to, to give him Bible studies with, with the smoke and all. And we got down to the Bible study where um, a health, diet and health. Body temple. Body temple. And he was fascinated with that. And so we finally told him that... Uh, I think there's a text that uh, when men turn away from God, they turn to the bitter eat, um, weed bitter herb. or herb or something. So we like the bitter herb to tobacco. Mm -hmm. and so he was fascinated with it. And he says, well, why didn't you tell me that you didn't smoke? I think what really got him was the, uh, when he read, uh, know ye not that your body is a temple of God, and if mm -hmm. any man defile the temple of God, him will God destroy. And so he asked me, what do you mean by that? So um, my reply was, uh, well, let's take the church. We all respect the church. Would you take a cigarette into the church and smoke it? He said, of course not. Then I said, uh, would you take uh, alcohol into the church and drink it? He said, no. 
That would be silly. And so by making those comparisons, uh, finally I said, your body is the church. Your body is the temple. He said, then my smoking... I said, right. He said, uh, why didn't you tell me this on the first night? I said, if I had told you this on the first night, you wouldn't come the second night. He said, you know, that's right. So you can see where patience uh, is, a, is, a, is a virtue. If you use patience and take your time, it pays off. He told us that he realized he was getting into demon worship to the point where it was scaring him. He was frightened. And he prayed a prayer to God, even though he didn't realize it, and it wasn't with all the trappings that right. Christians usually use. But he said, if there is a God in heaven, help me. And at that time, you were an answer to his prayer. That's right. But also, weren't, wasn't he an answer to your prayer? He certainly was. When uh, Elder Taylor got to the point in his Bible studies of speaking about the Sabbath, all of my background, I was born in Halifax, uh, Cynthia was born in Montreal. All of my background was Baptist and some Methodist. And I couldn't see going to church on Saturday instead of Sunday. In fact, I would laugh at my wife for quite some time, even as a child, that the fact that she was going to church on the wrong day. Uh, but getting back to the point is uh, when we were taking those Bible studies and, and Nala Taylor got to the, the Sabbath question, he proved it, yet I didn't believe it. And there's a point in your, in your studying the Word of God that you want to stay with tradition rather than go with the truth. And I wanted to stay with tradition. But at the same time, the truth was pulling me back to the point where I said, I didn't even tell Cynthia this, Lord, if you want me to keep this Sabbath, let me, with the knowledge I have, win one soul. And if I do this, I know that it will be a sign. And not long afterward, I met Roger, sat down beside him, and he asked me for Bible studies. Mm -hmm. I know it was a sign. I'm here today. What part did Cyril's conviction about the Sabbath truth play in you being confronted by Christ with these eternal realities. So I understand that he wasn't even a baptized Seventh-day Adventist. He was baptized the first Sabbath you went to church. But what if he had not been convicted of the Sabbath and had told your Jewish boss mm -hmm. that he would be willing to work on the Sabbath? Well, I would, I would lose out on eternity, I believe. I would have lost hope. So his conviction... Yeah was part of the process that Christ used to mm -hmm. confront you. But the there's more reality. to this. He was working for a, a nice, a real nice firm, embroidery firm, and he was studying the Bible with Pastor Taylor, and Pastor Taylor had, had brought him now to the point where he said you should observe the seventh Sabbath. 